Okay, so uh, I think people have joined. Welcome everyone. Welcome to Bioimagine webinar series. Today our uh, speaker is Dr. Nirjar Dasgupta. Dr. Nirjar Dasgupta has done his PhD in plant molecular biology and later he did his postdoctoral fellowship uh, from uh, Indian Statistical Institute, Calcutta. So Dr. Nirjar is very passionate about teaching and obviously about statistics and he has a unique quality of blending uh, statistics tools into biological data. So I think for all the biologists out there, uh, it, is, it is very meaningful or it is very important to come out with a meaningful statistical interpretation from your biological data. So with this note, I welcome Dr. Nirjar Dasgupta to this forum. Through this presentation, I am going to explain about DNA barcoding. So, depending on which species you are working on, uh, you have to select the primer. The rest of the steps are very similar. That is, you have to collect the samples, then you have to extract the DNA, and then you have to go for uh, this DNA ampli PCR amplification. Then you go for sequencing. Other cases as well. Suppose this is so. This is one aspect that is suppose uh, two different organisms. They look very alike, or same species, but two different individuals are very different from each other. So in both of the cases, if you just go by the morphology, there is a huge chance that you might make a mistake. So the only way how you can find out whether this is the same species or different species is by molecular identification or molecular characterization. Now this is one aspect, this is uh, uh, this morphology. So, uh, there is another aspect for this morphology that is the morphological characteristics. It is estimated that the more molecular characteristics, they generally get affected by environmental changes. So the same species, if you move that from one particular place to another place, there is a huge morphological study. So I personally had an experience. So I worked generally worked on with uh, the span species, the mangrove species. I'll come to that in a bit. So there is a species which I had isolated or I had basically collected from uh, the Sundarbans mangrove forest, which is present in West Bengal. So when we try to plant the same plant, I mean, we, we try to grow the same plant in a normal, that is in, uh, uh, in, in the areas where salary is relatively low. In that areas, I, I, I mean, I remember that the leaf morphology that changed hugely. Like uh, when in Sundarbon, that used to be uh, round in shape, that particular uh, leaf. But when we try to grow them in a normal salinity, that is one or two PPT salinity, a normal condition, then it, the shape of that particular same leaf, same species started to get elongated. So this is basically what we, but we didn't find any molecule, uh, uh, any difference at the molecular level, any significant difference at the molecular level. So although there is morphologically they are different, but we couldn't find any significant uh, genetic difference or distance among those two. So this is a classical example what I am trying to uh, mention here that morphology tends to get affected by environment. Whereas if you go for this molecular, uh, uh, molecular study or molecular characterization, they generally do not, at least that much, they generally do not get affected by environmental changes. So this is one aspect. Another aspect is suppose you are given any uh, 
raw or processed food that is that maybe a, a fish or a meat or that can be an herb or anything so you after it has been processed so after it has been skinned and suppose if you see this particular diagram if it is a cube shaped fish now you have no process or you have no given technique to find out which species does this belong to whatever they will tell you have to believe because now you have no uh, process or no technique of finding out whether that's what they are saying is correct or not you have to blindly believe that but this dna barcode i'll just show you an example this work actually was done back in 2008 where two 11s uh, grader that is uh, who studies in class 11 in new york they did a market substitution study so in that what they did they surveyed 60 samples collected from four restaurants and 10 grocery stores among them they actually could identify 54 among those 60 so with the given markers uh, how we'll come to that in a bit how exactly this process is being done this dna uh, identification but just to give you an idea out of those 60 samples 54 they could find out i mean uh, this genetic study could was successful and it was found out from the study that 13 among those 54 were mislabeled that is that is not the same species or same particular let's say if that is a uh, fish so they it is not exactly the same fish which they claim they are selling so in the the generally what, what i was saying the processed food you did till now we didn't have any process to find out whether this is what they are claiming but now with this dna barcoding this gives us the a new tool with which even the processed food we can tell whether this belongs to this species or not so this uh, study was actually found uh, uh, was published in this food research international uh, lcd journal and uh, so what the uh, the data that they found out was two out of four and six out of ten grocery stores they were selling mislabeled fish so now the problem is that not that whether they are doing this intentionally or not maybe they are also not doing this intentionally but the proper identification system was not there to find out whether this is the same species which they are claiming to be or not so seven out of the nine sample listed as red snapper they were mislabeled and they included anything coming uh, within this Acadian redfish from North, and, uh, North Atlantic for then uh, Pinjalo from Southeast Asia. So these are all different uh, uh, species of lab, species of uh, fish which are uh, found in different parts of the country or, or, or the world. So they spotted goat fish sold as Mediterranean red mullet. Now once you are selling that as a cube or even you are, you are selling them as it is, very few actually can identify which species is that just by looking at it because of this morphology many of the different species may look very similar morphologically and ultimately what they found out was they were selling this uh, uh, this particular shop was selling a white albacore tuna which is approximately 8.5 dollar uh, per pound wholesale price and instead of that the dna study that found out that particular fish was Mozambique tilapia, which is the price is approximately $1.70 per pound. So that is a huge difference. So this one is being sold, that is the tilapia is being sold as tuna because morphologically they were very similar to each other. So this particular whole incident, this is unfamously called as sushi gate. Anyway, now coming to the barcode benefits. So uh, it is a taxonomic identification tool alternative to or additional to the morphology. Now there has been a very big speculation over this that uh, DNA barcoding actually is taking, I mean this is an alternative or taking over the conventional taxonomic identification or from morphological tax uh, identification system. This is actually not doing that. This is just being an additional tool to what you already have now we already this morphological system was present but this dna barcode this is just giving an extra tool so that the identification becomes flawless 
This can process a great number of specimens at a time, thus is successful for examples in biodiversity study. So you, you don't have to go for one species or one sample at a time. You actually can uh, can go with a number of samples. Now, for example, I will explain in a bit that in my study, which I did on barcoding, I had a total of 21 species and each of them were collected from 10 different locations. So that was a huge number of data and all, a huge number of samples. And I actually was able to work with all of them at, uh, together because the uh, uh, because of the primers. Now the samples can be used irrespective of age or tissue type. Now this is very beneficial. Why? Because even a very, suppose when I'm talking about a plant, even a small plantlet can give the same result as that as of a hundred year old tree. Both of them as because the genetic material will be the same. So no matter at which growth stage of life they are, no matter from where you are collecting, suppose if I am talking about plant, whether I am collecting the sample from leaf, whether I am collecting it from root, whether I am collecting from any uh, from the fruit or whatever I am doing, the, the genetic makeup of each of the cell as we go, the genetic makeup of each of the cell is same, so we can actually take any of these samples. So this can be used in ecological forensics, as I mentioned, suppose uh, same if anyone is selling you this is this particular herb in, in, a, in a bottle so you till now you have no other process of finding out whether this is this or not a few chemical techniques will be there chemical reactions will be there but that are very limited but for all of this species all of whether it's a herb whether it is a, a meat whether it is a plant any living form that can be uh, identified using this particular technique and once the reference database is established, it can be applied by non specialists So first, you have to identify it, you have to sequence it, and then you have to store it in the database. The rest of it, when the other species which are same as this, this collection can be done by any non specialist So they can just be trained on how this, this thing is done, and even a layman can do that with proper training, with minimal training actually, not proper training. Now, uh, the next is choosing a DNA barcode. So that is, as I mentioned, one particular gene or a couple of gene or a particular DNA sequence. So ultimately, we have to find a small stretch of DNA, which act should have the capacity to distinguish that particular species from rest of the species. Now, there's any, another very important thing here, which will come in a bit, that is uh, this a particular uh, this particular primer or uh, this particular strand of DNA that I am talking about, which should have the ability to distinguish it. Now, this should be able to distinguish your species from the rest of the species, but at the same time, this should not distinguish between your own species. So, suppose you are collecting one particular species from five different locations, so there must be some genetic diversity among them. So your, this DNA barcode system should be able to distinguish self from non-self. That is the interspecific diversity that is within the species and the intraspecific diversity that is your species and other species that should be distinguished. There should be a threshold value for the intraspecific and the interspecific so that that can be used as a DNA barcode. I'll explain that uh, in a bit, a little bit more explicitly. Now, uh, the, there are few three criteria which should be fulfilled for any particular strand or stretch of DNA to be used as a DNA barcode. That may be a gene, that may be a locus, whatever it is. So what are them? The three are universality, robustness and discrimination. Universality means this particular, so suppose I am identifying two different uh, or one specific gene for this identification. Now, this particular gene should work for all plant species that is present on Earth. So, this, if they are working only in monocot plants and not working on dicot plants, that won't, that doesn't make sense. So, the, whatever uh, the locus or gene you select, that should have the universality. That is, that should can be or that should be used for all different plant species present on Earth. 
robustness that is uh, they should be able to find out or distinguish this intra and interspecific and the discrimination that is the same as I was mentioning the so suppose within species also there should be some uh, genetic diversity so this particular DNA barcode should be able to discriminate that from the interspecific diversity. Now here is an example suppose the first one here as you can see this is a multiple sequence so if you can see this is very much conserved this whole area is very much conserved this is very good for PCR so it is you can uh, you can have this uh, design the primer and then you can go for this PCR and all those things but when you are going for at the barcoding this particular primer whatever you used for this study that is a disaster why because there is no way where you can distinguish among the six different species so as a barcode or the, as the objective of the study you should be able to distinguish the different species from each other so that particular thing is not available here now if you come to the second example here you have a huge amount of diversity now too much of diversity again that may be good for your barcoding but this is impossible to PCR because you cannot design a primer. If you design a primer for this there is no guarantee the others will be amplified. So this one is good hypothetically for barcoding but this is not good for the process of barcoding or for PCR. And next is this third one which is approximately 70% conservation that is uh, same but 30 percent a little bit of genetic diversity is there so this is an unique uh, for or this basically so whatever primer was used this is unique for being used as a dna uh, barcode primer why because you can distinguish these six species among each other at the same time you also would be able to design this primer because there are very high degree of similarity because or conservation among these uh, six different species. So this is another aspect which you have to keep in mind when you are preparing or you are identifying the DNA barcode marker. Now the applications, this can, the applications is biodiversity studies as we mentioned, new species identification, then disease diagnosis and paste diagnostic in agriculture. So these four are the basic uh, applications of barcode. Now coming to the procedure, so this uh, is a schematic diagram for uh, the procedure of how this barcoding can be done. So this is from specimens. So these are the different specimens which can be used. So what you have to do, you have to collect it, the specimens from, the, in, from their uh, respective locations. Then you have to go for DNA extraction. Then you have to select the candidate barcode region. Now you have to, before going for this, or the final study you have to find out or you have to finalize which genes are you or which locus are you going to go for this study and then you have to go for uh, PCR amplification then sequence those amplified regions then you have the sequence files and then by data analysis you will find out which area should be utilized as the DNA barcoding region and once you have done it then it is exactly the same so now you know the barcode region you know the primers which are available for that so simply you collect the sample all the samples then you go for DNA extraction then you go for the amplification using that particular primer and then go for the sequencing and data analysis and once that is done there this is a very uh, unique or very specialized uh, system which is called as bold now this is an inventory in which only the barcode information is being uh, is being stored so this is work uh, hand in hand with the normal ncbi one but this is the bold this is specific for barcode analysis so in if you go to this website you will be able to find out only the sequences which were done for this barcoding. Suppose if uh, uh, if you go for any animal, then the, the, the particular barcode, generally uh, the one that is being done for uh, this your animal is called as the COI, Cytochrome C oxidase subunit one. And then from plant for plant, there are a few ones, I'll come to that. So all the sequences, they are deposited in this particular one and against that one particular bean is generated that is a particular uh, same way as uh, that your 
uh, barcode that is being generated for each of the species that has been submitted in bold. So the same species or uh, same sequences you will be able to find out in NCBI as well but they are also submitted in bold as because this is separately only for uh, the barcode. Now this is there are if you go to this website you will see there are different sections some are for plant then for animal then for different insects then bacteria for each there are different primers so or different markers so that's why it is uh, kept separately. Anyway, now coming to this barcode region, so what are the regions or genes or locus which can be used for this barcode? Now for animal it is very uh, widely accepted that COI, cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1 as I mentioned that is a mitochondrial gene. So that is used for the identification of uh, most animal species. The reason this particular gene was able, uh, this gene was able to distinguish maximum of the animal that is present or not. So that's why this is universally accepted. Now there are four properties which make this genome specially suitable for identifying species. That is greater difference among the species, high copy number, relative few differences within species, intron less. So greater differences among species is basically the entire specific genetic diversity that I was talking about and relatively few difference within species in the intraspecific that I was talking about. And high copy number and intron less that is no non-coding region within this. But this COI seems to not work for plant system. This has not worked for identification of plant species or this has not been or can could not be used as a the, uh, barcoding region for in plants. The reason mitochondrial genes do not differ sufficiently due to their slow mutation rate. So that is the reason and why uh, this COI was a mitochondrial gene. So that's why COI could not distinguish plant species one from another because of their slow mutation rate. So the segregation is not that good. So that's why based on the recommendation by a barcoding consortium, that is a consortium of barcode type, there is a consortium actually for this barcode of life where uh, scientists and uh, professors from different parts of the world, they are a part of this and uh, they have an uh, this bold system actually is being maintained in uh, Canada. So in Canada, many scientists are there who are working on this. So they recommended the Chloroplast plus gene RBCL and MATK, they come very close to being the ideal candidate for the universal plant code. Now here, this is basically um, uh, the flowchart of how the work on uh, plant DNA barcoding was done. So that is uh, the Chris et al. who and Chase et al. who first started with uh, back in 2005 and then various scientists, they have worked with different this genes and locus and to find out which can be used as the universal DNA barcode for plant. Now, uh, what have been found out till now is that the RBCL and MATK, they come very close, but they alone cannot identify or they have not been 100% full proof. So what has been the recommendation from this consortium of barcode of life is any one or two other genes or locus along with RBCL. So you have to take into consideration RBCL and MATK. And along with that, you have to take into consideration a few other genes. So any one among these genes can be tried. So this actually what we have found out is that different group of plants, they give better result with different, uh, uh, different uh, plant, different markers. Now this RBCL and MATK, they have been, I, I mean, given these two are very common. Uh, that some Many other genes or locals have been found out. So this, all of this. And during, uh, so this is one paper that was uh, published by the CBOL, that is uh, the plant, uh, barcode of life, uh, plant group, working group. So they have found out that these are the average discrimination power of each of these different markers. So this is basically what uh, has al already been done. Now before I come to the work that I have done or that was done in our lab. So before that I want to uh, explain one last thing that is called as DNA barcoding gap. 
So uh, suppose I am collecting one particular species, let's say a particular plant species from the four different parts of the world, uh, of the country. So I am I have done my work with uh, the mangrove species. So suppose I am collecting the mangrove from four different areas of uh, our country. So one is from Sundarbon, another we are collecting from Odisha, another we are collecting from Andhra Pradesh, another we are collecting from Andaman. So I am collecting the four same samples, four same species. This is Ilocarpus or any other species. Now, if you go to or if you see the overall uh, information about these four areas, they vary very much from each other. I mean, let's say the uh, weather pattern, the rainfall and the average temperature, all of these are quite different from each other, soil chemistry, various parameters. So all of them are quite different from each other, these four. So now when I am collecting one particular species, there should be a genetic diversity within that particular species. So suppose as I mentioned, I'm collecting uh, Xylocarpus granatum, one particular species. So that particular species, if I'm collecting from these four different sites, there has to have some genetic diversity among them number one now if i am collecting different some other plants as well they also will have some genetic diversity so suppose i am collecting heldera fomis or brugeria so there also there will be some genetic diversity but there should be a threshold level that is the genetic diversity within the species that i'm working suppose uh, what i mentioned is xylocarpus granata so the diversity among Xylocarpus granatum collected from these four regions should never cross the genetic diversity between Xylocarpus granatum and Brugeria gymnorhiza, another species. So what I mean by that, again in the next slide, is that this intraspecific, that is within species diversity, this should always be less then that of the interspecific diversity. If this curve, this represents the interspecific diversity within different species, then that should always be bigger than the intraspecific that is within the same species. And if there is an overlap between these two, that is even the highest intraspecific diversity and the lowest interspecific, even there is an overlap between those two, then that particular marker, that is the gene or locus, whatever you are using for this DNA barcoding, that cannot be used. There should always be a gap between the interspecific and inter, intraspecific and interspecific. This gap is called as the barcoding gap. So if this gap is present, that means that particular uh, marker can be used as a barcoding, uh, as a barcode. If this gap is not present, that means that particular marker cannot be used as a barcode. So this is very important in DNA barcoding. So after all the studies you do, you have to find out about this particular gap, whether that is present or not. If that is present, then you can use that particular uh, uh, gene or uh, locus or combination of gene locus as the barcoding agent or marker. But if there is an overlap, then you cannot use this. Okay, and then obviously this is a representative diagram of the multiple uh, sequence alignment and uh, the genetic diversity study that you have to do. And this is the phylogenetic tree. Anyway, so now coming uh, very briefly about uh, my studies. So uh, I have, as I mentioned, I have worked with 21 different species which are usually found in Sundarban. So what my objective of the study was to create a molecular uh, database for the uh, Sundarbun region. So I selected all the species that was present and this is basically my uh, a part of my NPDF uh, work. So I collected all the species from 10 different regions within Sundarbun. So uh, these regions, they differ from each other uh, in salinity wise. Some are very close to the sea, some are uh, very distant to the sea. So there is a huge 70 difference between the different uh, different um, uh, these areas from where I have collected. So uh, for testing this for uh, different what are the different barcodes uh, primers? So these are the ones that we selected: RBCL, MATK, 
TRNLH and then TRNH, PSBA, ATP, FH, PSBK, PSBI and these are the plastic DNA regions and these two are the nuclear DNA regions. So these are the markers that I uh, had selected for my studies and then uh, this is basically uh, how the multiple sequence alignment uh, looks like and this is the so after the study what I found out so this is the tree only for the RBCL data so this tree is only for the uh, amplification done with RBCL gene and so this was able to distinguish mostly among uh, other species with a few exceptions uh, so here as you can see uh, this Abyssinia alba on species so they were separate but Abyssinia in this area where I have selected is Abyssinia merina one species and alba another species although they are from the same family but they are different species so they one at one point they came uh, very close to each other rather than getting segregated merina here this came with the officinalis so maximum part it was able to segregate or distinguish but there are some exceptions like this where it couldn't distinguish properly and this is the ITS2 tree so here also sub, at, to some extent it was able to distinguish but there were some as you can see here Avicinia officinalis, Avicinia alba, Avicinia marina so all are clubbing some of the species they have clubbed together and so this is uh, another example where two, as you can see, two different species, they are coming in the same clade, Xylocarpus carnatum and Xylocarpus mecongensis. So to some extent, it was able to distinguish, but there are a few, exam a few uh, exceptions as well. And when we uh, plotted this inter and interspecific diversity step, uh, this uh, data, we didn't find any potential barcode gap. So as you can see here, all the data are overlapping. So generally there should be a gap between the highest intraspecific and the lowest intra, in, in, intraspecific. And that is the highest one is here and the lowest one is here. So this is clearly overlapping here and here as well. So RVCL or ITS2 singly they cannot be used as DNA barcode. What, from our studies, what we found out, they cannot be used singly at, uh, as the potential barcode candidate. So uh, next thing that we did was basically we um, uh, have taken into consideration multi-locus approach. That is in this what we have done, we have taken into consideration RBCL plus MATK plus ITS2. So all the three data we have taken into consideration together and that was actually if you can see these diagrams over here this is the phylogenetic trees so this approach this multi locus approach was able to distinguish among these all different uh, uh, species even the families they could be distinguished suppose uh, as i mentioned avicinia alba avicinia lips avicinia officinalis so they can be or they could be successfully distinguished from each other and when we plotted again the genetic diversity study our data of this multi locus approach we found out here there is a clear barcoding gap between the intra specific diversity and the inter specific diversity over here so what basically the uh, our uh, study what the result we got from our study is that from uh, for this at, at least this uh, uh, this uh, species number of species mango species that you work with for them this multi locus approach rbcl matk along with them its2 that was found to be a successful candidate for uh, uh, for this dna barcoding and then we have proposed to use this to uh, i mean use this multi locus approach in uh, other type of plant species and other plant species to find out its universality that is whether this can be utilized as a potential barcode candidate for all the different uh, plant species or not. So and now the next or the last thing here is as I mentioned the role in conservation. Now what from our studies we have found out is that uh, the mangroves generally they are found to be uh, said to be uh, salt loving but not all mangrove species are actually salt loving. Some of them actually are salt tolerant. So when the salinity increases are up to a certain level, they can withstand. But if it goes beyond that, 
it was found to not being able to withstand that and then in those areas it was dying so if anyone is planning for a conservation so suppose the, uh, a conservation of this different plant species this program is going on all around the world so if you are trying to conserve the same species in the same salinity zone in which it was not able to grow naturally if you again try to grow them by uh, by this planting them uh, them again then they won't be able to grow because they are not finding that salinity suitable so uh, the way how this can be done is to grow them at a temperature sorry at a salinity which is less than that in which they could sustain easily now this is some of the importance of mangrove uh, why uh, uh, they should be conserved and how they are getting lost that is by sea storms siltation sieve culture etc and also by illegal poaching and uh, so from our study what we can uh, help is them is the barcode can identify the species from any material so i barcoding can actually stop this illegal poaching if uh, this is done properly so suppose if you are doing the illegal poaching of you, you are cutting down the mangrove trees and then you are saying this is normal plant this is not mangrove there again there was no way how you can identify so but now using this dna barcoding technique even from a, a processed wood you can actually find out which particular species does this belong to so if that belongs to any uh, any any particular mangrove species which you are not supposed to cut then that illegal poaching can i mean the, uh, the the forest officers if they want they can or if they want to implement this particular technique they will be able to find out whether this is an illegal poaching is going on or not so these are uh, the some of the other things uh, which we uh, i mean which can be done if uh, this particular dna barcoding uh, this technique is implemented properly so with that i am coming to this end of uh, this webinar and in this diagram this is a hypothetical uh, uh, this your uh, figure or diagram so here it is uh, it is we uh, propose or we hope someday there will be a machine like this so if you just put one part of an animal into this sensor the sensor is going to this particular machine or instrument is going to say which particular species does this one belongs to this particular uh, whatever part you are taking so with that uh, i am ending this uh, webinar thank you uh, dr nirjar uh, so it was a wonderful talk i thoroughly enjoyed it and uh, any questions from the audience Thank you. Okay, as I see, there are no questions, so I have two yeah, uh, questions to ask. Basically, uh, during my uh, PhD work, I have done a lot of uh, right. uh, like pattern recognition work, uh, where I used to work on medicinal plants. So, right. in medicinal plants, my work was to look for phytochemicals and then use them as markers so that they can be, you know, identified in class, uh, classifying them under what therapeutic properties they have. So, keeping in mind uh, uh, that that concept, I, I used several uh, like uh, analytical instruments like FTIR, UV, uh, uh, NMR spectroscopy and uh, then used to you know, align all the phytochemicals which was identified through that and then uh, see how the pattern right. used to look like. So then uh, because the pattern is important and in this study also you are seeing a genetic DNA barcoding pattern. So how uh, is it possible to correlate uh, the study uh, which is like a DNA barcoding, uh, the similar type in, in uh, uh, plant sciences or where the marker are phytochemicals basically or like plant metabolites, primary metabolites, secondary metabolites. Yeah. So. Uh see what uh, from my experience or i can tell you is that 
it is true uh, that some of the medicinal plants they have very unique uh, phytochemicals which are being produced now if you think from another point of view phytochemicals are basically secondary right. metabolites so now, right. so now secondary metabolites they have a, any plant that you take mm -hmm. they have a huge uh, expression i mean their expression is highly related with the different environmental factors right like right. for example if you grow the same plant in a stress condition then the pattern of produ production of those phytochemicals will be different from those which you are growing in an area which are less uh, less uh, any stress is there so now if you are collecting the same species from two different areas and if you are studying the same phytochemical you are going to see a different level of expression mm -hmm. okay right so this problem can be overcome using this dna barcode all right so uh, i think i think we can use uh, this information also to save lot of uh, medicinal plants which are getting extinct uh, now and then and also we can save more and more identify more and more species and uh, stop them from from poaching i i I'll, I'll give you a very uh, uh, recent example that is darjeeling tea which is indigenous to india mm -hmm. and that is of very high cost and demand in european countries so recently there is a report that uh, some uh, this uh, sri lankan companies they are exporting darjeeling tree they don't have any darjeeling tree they cannot have any darjeeling tree so and there is no i mean it's the same way if you are selling the tree you cannot actually find out which particular species or what variety mm. but it was actually found out using this dna barcoding and it was able to distinguish the different varieties so although the species is different same the t uh, camellian sinensis but the varieties were different and they were able to distinguish them and then uh, according to that they were they had challenged that company that indian tea board and until ultimately that company stopped producing that particular thing so this is one uh, example which i personally am aware of right so i i think it will be a very good contribution to ayurvedic medicinal plants exactly 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 so another very evident example would be you must be aware of there was a problem in eastern part of india mainly kolkata region where one news came up that dog and other meats are being used instead of chicken bhagar and mangsh right so that again that problem can also be solved using this particular technique uh, if even with the processed food if you go for this study you can actually distinguish which particular species this meat has come from okay okay right. so uh, like if uh, there's another question yeah. where we can see the interspecific and the intraspecific right. so right. like the species difference there has to be a gap and uh, what is the gap or what is the specificity uh, you are using it sensitivity or specificity right. for right. for uh, you know uh, making this model very uh, robust or uh, you know repeatability see uh, see uh, yeah see uh, what we found out was uh, 90 uh, 95 to 96 percent was uh, the threshold value that we had kept so if the diversity is less than 95 or 96 degrees uh, i mean uh, the di uh, genetic diversity intra specific i'm talking about if it is less than 94 5 or 96 then that cannot be taken up as an uh, barcode one so generally uh, by uh, i mean although i plan for 96 but i have to come down to 95 for the study okay 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 so like in case if there is not a single marker right. which is that robust in that case also we can have multiple markers which can be pulled together to increase the robustness of the uh, exactly. model exactly. which are using it exactly. okay okay so that will i think uh, make the model much more robust and we can re re uh, reproduce the model again and again on different uh, samples or different species no, animal it was found out that uh, the cy1 that mm -hmm. was find uh, found to be uh, distinguishing almost all of the animal species 
So okay. For that animal Mantilocus generally is not being used. UI singly is enough. But for plant it has been found out. Again from bacteria 16S RNA has been found to be more than enough. Mm -hmm. But for plant there wasn't one particular uh, this gene. So that's why this Mantilocus one was tried. And actually this is being tried now also. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, good evening. Uh, myself, Dr. Neha. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, I have a very basic question. Like, uh, what are the basic steps, you know, in DNA barcoding? Because most of us are not from the same field. Right. So we just want to understand, like, how uh, we are doing this barcoding, to be honest. And second one is, do you think uh, DNA barcoding could help with the human disease research as well? Uh, okay. Uh, so the first step, uh, first for to come into your first question. Uh, so depending on which species you are working on, uh, you have to select the primer. The rest of the steps are very similar. That is, you have to collect the samples, then you have to extract the DNA, then you have to go for uh, this DNA amp PCR amplification, then you go for sequencing. Once you have the sequence data, now you go for uh, this. Uh, blast and other sequence alignment tools to find out which particular sequence does this belong to and moreover how much is the difference that i was talking about and there are multiple different softwares available free softwares i personally used mega and uh, so i found that uh, more uh, easy to use so that's why i use it uh, so using that you can find out the genetic diversity intraspecific and interspecific which I was talking about and then you can just plot it and then you can do it. So and in the slide in the uh, presentation also I had one slide in that I had shown uh, the, uh, the process. So this is one. Now coming to human disease generally DNA barcoding uh, has limited uh, I would say uh, very limited application in human uh, this uh, disease uh, study the reason behind that uh, for so suppose uh, let's say a human disease if you are talking about let's say genetic disease so in that maybe uh, this kind of study can be of any help uh, like whether any particular if there's a genetic study genetic disease there will be some mutations at the genetic level which you can find out using different markers or after the sequencing uh, but apart from that dna barcoding is mostly uh, if i would say this is a taxonomic tool to find out new species and all those things or to distinguish one species from another so that is the primary goal of this particular thing okay so actually i was just uh, googling out you know and i'm not sure about this particular study that they have quoted it's a new study and I think it was published somewhere in August 2019. Okay. They use the term uh, dual DNA barcoding, you know, uh, that is one thing. And they are mainly talking about uh, this uh, diagnosis of invasive fungal disease. Because right. we all know during this COVID era, uh, black fungus, other, you know, a lot of other infectious uh, uh, agents are involved where there is a life threat. Uh, to the human, you know, so mainly, uh, let's say if you want to give something to the patient, you know, like, so that a clinician can have access to potentially life saving, you know, treatment option that can be given much sooner, actually, uh, if we have this kind of technology with us, maybe in future, if we can plan, you know, right. to develop something that really help to get a treatment at a sooner level, actually, yeah. as compared to the option that we have right now. So this is what required to manage most of the severe disease so that patient won't, you know, uh, we won't allow you to die because of uh, right treatment at the right time because of poor diagnosis. So uh, if you are expert in this area, uh, so I, I would like to, you know, give some insight uh, in this area, if possible, you know, to do some research uh, or if we can translate such research into a diagnostic tools with the help of you know industry and academia collaboration uh, that will be a very wonderful things where we can trans or uh, translate some knowledge at least to you know some diagnostic tools where overall community can 
get benefited out of it so what do you think on this part yes exactly i uh, very much agree with you so uh, if uh, so suppose the whole world actually has suffered tremendously in the last few months actually not a few months more than a year now and i mean at least in our country we don't probably don't have anyone now who doesn't have anyone very near to him or her who has suffered during this last few years so any thing which can be done and any work that needs to be done in this particular segment this is this should be the utmost priority apart from anything else new technique if several commission of the existing techniques that can help in at least the proper identification properly what are the different measures can be taken if those things are found out there is nothing like that so i am very much open to this uh, this kind of a thing if any any such thing can be done, uh, can be done actually we are, we both are from uh, industry background both uh, dr somnath and myself okay and uh, we love to take a couple of project that can be you know good for human health if we can do anything if we contribute anything you know right and wherever there is a possibility to collaborate between industry and academy at the same time uh, obviously there is a vi- commercial viability must also be there you know uh, as you rightly said this barcoding technology is very much helpful in species identification food or oh, you given the example of agriculture and fisheries and all you know so i am from the human diagnostic background uh, so i just you know interested to know more about the application of this uh, barcoding <laughs> tools and technology in the human disease management and all so i love to uh, connect with you in uh, soon with the help of uh, dr gatak he is doing great job while connecting all scientific community you know the different background right and that is the whole idea of bioimaging you know to exactly. share the knowledge and let's see how we are going to strengthen each other and how we are going to collaborate more and more where we can you know uh, do more and more contribution towards the society so thank thank you uh, thank you right. so much dr das gupta yeah. for for taking out the time i thoroughly enjoy uh, your you know, entire session to be honest uh, this evening and uh, yeah Yeah. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Koshar. And this is actually a very good proposal, and I would, uh, I mean, I would be more than happy to uh, communicate with you in the uh, so, I mean, not too far future, and sooner future, so that any anything which can be done or any plan, if that can be chalked out, so if that is for the betterment, so I'm always off for that. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Koshar, uh, for your valuable inputs. any other uh, questions so this is this session is open for q and a please any questions you can ask you can uh, you can feel free to ask uh, this is your time and uh, okay if there are no questions then i i thank uh, nirjar da that is what i would like to call him uh, thank you for your time thank you for your <laughs> wonderful talk and um, uh, please please uh, see and come to the bioimaging youtube channel and uh, like subscribe so if you have any comments or if you want to have more sessions on a particular topic please do let me know i will try to you know coordinate with the expert in the field and uh, get back to you with some similar interesting topics uh, which will definitely help you in in designing your research work or in in uh, in your research work for sure or at least you know guide others in doing their research work in methodologies so with this note i thank you dr nirjar dasgupta uh, for your wonderful talk and for your wonderful uh, time uh, <laughs> thank you for, for providing the platform also thank you thank you